It's very nice to be here in Abbotsford and to meet you all. I'm looking forward to meeting you all and stumbling over names and all that that happens when you meet a bunch of new people, but you'll have to have mercy with me or on me and deal gently with the young lad. I'm young David, he's older David. Let's read in Isaiah chapter 1, the book of Isaiah chapter 1. And verse 18, Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 18. Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If ye be willing and obedient, ye shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured with the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. I love to think of this as the gospel call, the call, where God is calling human beings to come to him. And that's really what we've been hearing about, the gospel. And so here in the Old Testament, Isaiah the prophet, representing God, he is giving the very, very words of God, and we are reminded in the verse that the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. And so that tonight, if God could speak one word to you, now you may be here, I'm not sure if it's your first time, I really don't know hardly anybody here, but if it's your first time here and you are wondering, what will these men say to me? Let me remind you first of all that it's actually God who is speaking to you. And if we could sum up the one word that God would say and could say with meaning and with force and with sincerity, I think we could use this one word just to sum it up. Come. Come. It is the great gospel word. It sums up the simplicity of the gospel and it just tells us exactly what is in the mind of God for you and for me. For sinners of all stripes and sizes and ages, He just says, come, so that we have the gospel in these few words in verse 18. And I want to just think of it in this way. It is an inviting call. Do you know why I'm here? For one reason. I've been invited. And so 21 hours ago or so, I stumbled from my bed and got in my car and drove over two hours to an airport So that I could take the 620 flight from airport to airport to airport and arrived here because I was invited to come here. And now you see, I'm coming to kind of work with you and to help you. And many people misinterpret the call of God as something like that, that God is inviting us and he really wants my help. He wants the few little things that I might bring. And so that they sense this inviting call from God because God is kind of short on conscripts and he needs just a few people to to bear crosses and and to sing songs of Zion and, and he just kind of needs a few people to fill heaven. Well, that's not the call of the gospel per se. So it is an inviting call. But when we come to Isaiah chapter 1, we understand this. God is inviting people that really are not to be the helpers of God. He is not inviting them to come with the things that they would bring. In fact, he says, the things that you are bringing in your hands, the sacrifices you bring to me, he says, I am sick of them. He says, your very hands are defiled with blood. And he said, the things that you bring, your gifts, and the Sabbath days, the religious services, he says, I have headed to here with them. I don't want them. And so that he is inviting people that had displeased him. And yet, in sincerity, he says, come. Now that's hard to, hard to understand. It's hard to take in. But that's what the message is. He is not coming so you can help God. And in fact, 
The first thing that God wants to do for you, and primarily the thing he wants to do, is to save you from your sins. And you and I can't help him do that. In the very passage, we understand that our representatives, it was the nation of Israel, and Isaiah speaks to them, and they were just a sampling of all of the world. And in the Isaiah chapter 1, we understand that these people and us represented by them, we were not desirable to God. We find that in chapter 1, if we were to read in the first few verses, he says, these people, they're like children that I've actually nourished them. I've given them food. I think of an uncle that I had one time, and he pretty much raised a couple of grandkids that he had, and one of those in particular, he, he could almost be hateful to his grandfather. And yet that grandfather did everything for him. He was so kind to him. He gave him a home that he never would have had when he would have gone into social services or something. And with a father that rejected him, that grandfather took him. And he did everything with him. He took him places. He gave him a quality of life. He allowed him to eat at his table. And that grandfather, those grandparents, made themselves poor. Well, for everybody, but really for, in, at that time for, for one grandson in particular who was rejected. Well, God says, I have nourished children. I've brought them up. I've done my best to point them in the right directions. I was trying to convey to my kids something of what it was like when the Bible speaks of children like arrows. I have four children. Well, they would probably be insulted if I called them children. The oldest is 20, and the next one is 18, and then 17, and, and just turned 15. But anyway, I was trying to convey to them when I was having to say no, as parents have to do about a, some thing, some particular thing. And I was saying, I, I'm very, I, I almost feel like I shouldn't say sorry, but in a sense, I'm sorry. But my job, as far as God is concerned, is to, the, is to take you like an arrow in a bow and put as much force into your life as possible and aim it in the direction as I see fit from God. And when I let it go, when we let it go as parents, then it's out of our hands. We can't change the direction. But as long as you're in our home, we are trying to give you some direction and point you right so that your life would count. So giving you that direction, that's what a Christian home is all about. Well, God gave these people direction. He pointed them right. You know what some people think sometimes? That, well, people are not really bad people. It's just they're misguided and they're mistaught or else they're not taught. And that's why people fail. They just were a victim of their circumstances. And if someone had to just point at them right, then everybody would be basically good. But that's not the message of the Bible. And it's not the message... I came across this country from one side to the other to tell you that you are basically good and you just need a little bit of direction and pointing, not according to the Bible. God is inviting sinners to come to him. But he said sinners, whether they were these people, or if we come into our New Testament and find that these people were an example in Romans 3.19 of the whole world, and that includes you and I, that we are all the same, regardless of how right we are pointed, how correct the direction, how careful the teaching, how vast and the, the understanding of God's Word, yet still... We are like arrows that miss the mark. 
In fact, you know that that's what sin means? It means we miss the mark. Aim for the bullseye. We're taught what it is. God's word teaches us right from wrong. Apart from that, we wouldn't even know right from wrong. But God's word gives us right from wrong. It tells us the commandments, tells us what some people call the golden rule. And 10 of them come to the forefront, but really there's over 600 of them if you really want to get into it. And we are taught clearly right and wrong. And yet you and I constantly miss the mark. Despite our best intentions, we simply cannot hit the bullseye. And here God says, I have nourished children. I fed them. They lack nothing. I took a man's family and through his grandson, there were 12 sons and I built a nation out of them and I did everything I could for them. I fed them. I gave them a land flowing with milk and honey and they turned their backs upon me. And he says, I have brought them up. They were not some aimless people. I guided them. I led them. I gave them prophets. I gave them right and wrong. The commandments. I gave them the law. They know what they should do. And then do you know what the sad commentary is? They have rebelled against me. Do you know why they rebelled? Because they're sinners. And it became a matter of will. And sin always becomes a matter of will. We choose wrong because we want wrong. And we want wrong because we are sinners. That's what Isaiah chapter 1 says about these children, these people. And yet... The amazing thing is, can you get a hold of this tonight? That God says, come, I want you. I don't understand that. Why God invites sinners to come to him. He just simply does it because of what's in his heart. Come. But he doesn't stop with them as children. He says, Not only did they rebel against me, he says, they're actually, they don't even respond naturally. He says, the ox knows his owner, and the donkey, the ass, he knows his master's crib. But my people, they don't know, they don't consider. A few weeks ago, I was actually down in Massachusetts. Some may know Jonathan Procopio. Well, I was staying with Jonathan Procopio's younger brother, David, and Kathy Procopio. And we're having meetings there in a small assembly. And we were working on David's tractor. He had a New Holland tractor, and he had several issues with it. And I came from a farm, and I love tractors. And so we were working on it, getting it working. So we had to go to the tractor dealership for parts. And I wasn't going to be left out. I never missed a chance to go to a farm equipment dealership. And so we were there, and Dave was getting his parts, and I was wandering and looking at the stuff like a kid in a candy shop, and looking at the different things that were there. And first thing... Dave had a question. That was another Dave. A lot of Daves. But anyway, David had a question about a backhoe attachment that was out in the air. So the lady at the parts counter, she didn't know the answer, so she called the guy from the office. Don't know if it was the owner or the salesman or what he was. So he came wandering out of the office, didn't even know he was there. And as I'm looking at things and listening to the conversation, I was in the corner of my eye. I thought I saw a dog coming with him. I thought, oh, a dog. But it wasn't a dog. It was a goat. And here, wandering along behind this man's owner, head of the office, was this goat, proudly going along, horns out there, well, pointing back as if he owned the place, and he's trotting along behind his owner. You see, that goat knew who his owner was. The man, he actually didn't only come to the tractor dealership with him, he actually came home with him at night, and his daughter actually had him housebroken. That was a brute beast. The goat he walked across to Dave, who had bought his parts, and they say a goat will eat anything, and he had his bill in his hand, and before he knew what happened, he actually took a chunk out of his bill and started chewing on it. And the man said, Arthur, don't eat the man's bill. You see, the goat responded to his owner. And I thought, 
Isn't that true? Created beings, they respond to an owner. They recognize when someone has a claim upon them. They know who is the superior being. And yet people, God has a claim upon them. He is the supreme being. And yet human beings rebel against them. They don't respond. In fact, in our world, they even try to say that the God who created everything and loves them. They make up theories to say he doesn't exist. And yet, God says, come. He still gives the invitation. As children who rebelled against him, he invites them. But then he goes on from children that were absolutely heedless, who would not listen and respond. And he deals in this chapter with medical cases. Leprosy would have been a common problem back in those days, and they were ever to be watchful for it. And if leprosy was found upon the, among them because of its contagious nature, they would have to examine it, and there was tests that they went through, and then they would have to, if it was leprosy, they had to actually be put outside the, the camp and separated, because that's what sin does. Because that leprosy would begin to spread. And here the picture seems to be, whether it was leprosy or some other condition, of something that had completely defiled the being from the crown of the head right to the sole of the foot. There was nothing, there was no soundness, there was no health, there was no wellness, there was no wholeness. But he says there was only wounds and bruises and putrefying sores that were not bound up, oozing, sick. Gross sores. You know why they hadn't been bound up? Because these people were spiritual lepers and they didn't realize it. They wouldn't acknowledge it. They refused the doctor's prescription. Now that's... That's a remarkable thing. I had a sister who actually, my sister in the flesh, my own older sister, she actually brought me gravel last night because she knew I wasn't going to get much sleep and I was going to be driving and then flying. And she actually took me gravel so that in Moncton, or in Toronto Airport, I'd actually take a gravel and sleep the rest. And, you know, I, did, I didn't take it. I refused her prescription. Well, these people, they refused the treatment. And as medical cases, they were absolutely hopeless. There was just nothing that they could do. They were reaching the end of the line. As children, they were heedless. As medical cases, they were hopeless. They were at the end of the line. They were repulsive to God. They could not help themselves. All hope was gone, spiritually speaking. And still they were trying to offer God sacrifices. And he says, I don't want your sacrifices. Because your hands are defiled. And you know what he says? You and I, we wouldn't want to come near a person like that. And there are likely people in your community, people you've seen on the streets, and maybe even some relatives. And you just are not just too, too likely to spend an evening with them. Because to you they're repulsive. Sin does that. I was listening to some guys sitting behind me in an airport in Edmonton Airport today, and just just the words coming from their mouth, I didn't even really want to sit there and listen to them. It's not that I thought I was better than them. Thank God I'm saved by the grace of God. I don't need to say those words in a conversation. But there's something in us that sin even to us sometimes 
Not the sins we do, they're not repulsive, maybe. But the sins of someone else, we look and we know there's just something repulsive about that. There's just something that turns us off. Some sin that's worse than what we do. Do you know that every sin is like that to God? And yet, God says through Isaiah, Come. I wonder if there's a sinner here tonight and you've rebelled against God because of your nature. You're keeping him at arm's length. You've never received him. Despite his best and most sincere invitation, you said no thanks. And as medical cases, you say, well, I'm not that bad. I'm not hopeless. But that's what these people thought. But God saw them differently. And every sinner that has not been cleansed by the blood of Christ, our brother read of the cleansing of the blood. There was a dear Filipino lady, just young woman, just, just a couple of weeks ago, told me at the back of a hall after gospel meeting, described how she had been saved just on the Thursday night before, the night before. And she got that verse from God. That She couldn't even say the verse, remember how it was, but she just knew this. Jesus Christ, his blood cleaned me. It cleaned me. And she was shedding tears to tell me that his blood cleaned me. Listen, have you ever been cleansed by the blood of Christ? Well, these people hadn't. And they thought they were desirable to God. And they kept trying to approach him that way. God says, no, you don't come to me that way. You come with the place I'm, I'm giving you. And he says, come. Come as sinners. Let us reason together. I will change you. I will cleanse you. That's in the verse. We won't have time to touch it tonight. Maybe another night. The change of the gospel. But in this wonderful, beautiful call of the gospel, he invites Sinners that were heedless and sinners that were helpless who could not help themselves. And he says, come, please come. But there was one more. There was a nation here. And they are absolutely helpless. He says, There's, your country is desolate. Your cities are burned, in verse 7, with fire. Strangers actually devour it in your presence. And it's desolate. It's overthrown by strangers. And here were people that, that they were actually, because of their sin and their departure from God, God actually allowed people to come in and take over their land and oppress them. And as a nation, they were absolutely helpless. As children, they were heedless. As medical, medical cases, there was no hope. It was absolutely hopeless. And as strangers in their own land, and as captives with under the oppression of others at times in their nation, there was just nothing they could do for themselves. They were absolutely helpless. Listen, you know, you may think it's a dark picture, but it's a picture God gives. That you and I, naturally speaking, are captives... We are bound by chains that we cannot break. And there is a cruel enemy, Satan, who give, keeps us in our sins day after day, week after week, year after year, until life ends. And the sinner and the pleasure that God would have gotten from them, having saved them from their sins and taken them to heaven, God is actually robbed by this cruel master. And the sinner is robbed. What they could have known in heaven, what they could have known of sins forgiven, it is taken from them altogether. Listen, my friend, tonight, you are helpless too if you're not saved. And yet the message of the gospel is, sweetly, with care from God, in absolute sincerity, he says, come, come now, and let us reason together.
saith the Lord. He wants you to come, and he wants to save you. He wants to deliver you from your sins and to give you a home in heaven forever. It would be a wonderful thing if someone came tonight acknowledging what God says about these people he says of me and if they would come and be saved through the cleansing power of the gospel and the blood of Christ that has been shed. Shall we pray? Our Father, we thank thee for the gospel message We, indeed, as we have been hearing, we would love for someone to take this message personally. And it is powerful. And we would pray that someone tonight might drink it in. We know that sometimes we don't preach it in the inviting fashion that we should. But we have considered the words tonight of a God who is inviting. So sweetly he invited. And so so sincerely he called them. He even told them it was urgent. And he said, come now. He said, let us reason together. He was willing to lay the groundwork, the reason by which they could be delivered and they could come into relationship with God in the spiritual way. And so we would pray that tonight someone might drink this message in. Give us help, Lord, to continue in the will of God in this gospel series. Bring souls along. Those that have come tonight, we know they have problems other than spiritual problems. Those are the priority. And yet we would look to thee for other issues that they may be dealing with. And we would just ask thee that thou meet every one of our needs and take us now to our homes in safety and bless us in the evening and the interval before we would meet again, we pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.